Welcome to Hack the Entrepreneur, the show which reveals the fears, habits, and inner battles behind big name entrepreneurs and those on their way to joining them. Now here is your host, John Naster. Hey, hey, this is Hack the Entrepreneur. Thank you so much for joining me again today. I am your host, John Naster, but you can call me Johnny. My guest today is a writer, marketer, and an entrepreneur. After spending a few years as a content and senior content manager at UTest, my guest decided to step out on his own as a content and copywriter. While landing his first few clients, he realized he had created a unique way to pitch his work to potential clients. This new method was so effective, he almost immediately began hiring writers to fulfill the demand he was generating. This was the birth of N Marketing. My guest continued to grow N Marketing for three years until he could no longer hire writers fast enough. This further demand led him to turning his agency into Endash.co, a platform for writers to earn work by pitching brands unique content ideas. Now, let's hack Michael Brown. Does your website stress you out? From choosing the right hosting package to finding and updating plugins and themes, there's a lot to think about. When all you really want is a website that is fast, secure, and looks freaking awesome, right? I want to introduce you to StudioPress Sites, the answer to all of your website headaches. StudioPress Sites is a proven solution that gives you the ease of an all-in-one website builder, but with the flexible power of WordPress. It's perfect for bloggers, podcasters, affiliate marketers, and digital entrepreneurs, as well as those selling physical products digital downloads. With StudioPress sites, you have hosting, themes, plugins, and SEO tools all in one place. Sign up for StudioPress sites and you'll be set up in minutes without the hassle of installing WordPress, buying a theme, or sorting out the best plugins. Plus, included security and maintenance features that keep you and your site safe. It's designed to be easy and hassle-free. And yet, you can rest assured that if something does go off the rails, the friendly StudioPress support team is standing by 24-7 to assist you in getting back on track. If you're ready to see for yourself why over 200,000 website owners trust StudioPress, the industry standard for premium WordPress themes and plugins, just go to studiopress.com hack. And as a Hack the Entrepreneur listener, you're going to get your first month absolutely free. Once again, that's studiopress.com slash hack. We are back with another episode of Hack the Entrepreneur. And today we have a very, very special guest. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Happy to be here. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. You're a bit snowed in, but yeah, yeah it's, a good, it's a good day for podcasting, I guess. Yeah, so it's stretching from Toronto to Boston. You it, said you were getting snow where you are, right? It is. It is stretching. So, eh, you know, it's winter, I guess. Yeah. It's March. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's get through that, though. Yeah, exactly. All right. Let's jump into this. Sure. Michael, as an entrepreneur, can you tell me what is the one thing that you do that you feel has been the biggest contributor to your successes so far? So I think it's, Honestly, I think it's my ability, my eagerness to create something. So, you know, for me, I think entrepreneurship, you know, a lot of people see running as running a business as a very, you know, logistical task, a very tactical thing. I see it as a creative endeavor. So I, you know, I'm happiest and I'm most successful when I feel like I'm creating something from nothing, whether that be back in, you know, my days as a, as a content creator in house, you know, that was all of what I did. And then when you become an entrepreneur, you have to find new ways, you know, new ways to be creative or look at entrepreneurship as as a creative, you know, a creative field. So I think that is where, you know, why I've, you know, achieved a you know, moderate level of success here so far is because I've, I've tried to bring that creativity over to the entrepreneurial side. Nice. And did you do you feel like you have to do that? Because you no longer get to just do actual creation of content and such, so you have to kind of bring that creative side to it? I think so. I mean, yeah, I, th I think for me personally, like I had to, like I had to find a way to make this a creative, you know, a creative activity. 
I'm not sure that everybody feels like that. You know, I, I'm sure you talk to a lot of people where, you know, the the primary action for the entrepreneur, or, you know, for the entrepreneur is sales or it's, you know, partnerships or it's technology or, in, you know, technical innovation. But for me, it really is, you know, founded in creativity. Yeah, I love it because that's, I've said it like a hundred times on here, my definition of entrepreneurship is just simply the creation of something out of nothing. And so I'm really into it, but you're right. If there's technical minded people, there's the accountant sort of minded entrepreneurs, there's all different ones and they all kind of tackle it from their own way. Mm -hmm. And they're all doing something creative, whether they realize it or not. (laughs) So we're (laughs) right, no matter if they think so or not. Yeah. Fair enough. Did you sort of going into this though, did you, did you ever have a thought that maybe you thought about it wrong and you needed to sort of get grounded in that sort of like into the numbers or into the sales part of it rather than the creative side? So a lot of what I, you know, a lot of the business that I have now, it came as a result of very small prototyping. And by prototyping, you know, I had this vision for a platform, you know, a content creation platform, and there were elements of it that I wasn't sure people were going to go for. So we staged, you know, I call it prototyping. It's really interviews with potential customers or kind of explaining concepts and and basically, you know, taking very manual things that will eventually become sort of part of something bigger. But that is, you know, that's kind of where I started. So it was never, you know, it was never a huge leap of faith in that, you know, we want to build something really big and then hope that people use it. We broke down the elements of what we were creating and kind of tested those manually as we went along. Nice. Let's, yes. let's dive into this a bit if we can, because sure. it's, a, it's a fascinating, from what I know of it, it's a fascinating process you went through of your entrepreneurship was like from almost freelancing into an agency model. Mm-hmm. And then you got out of the agency model. Correct. So could you sort of take us back through sort of the process that you went through? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the the agency itself was was sort of a means to an end. So when I broke out on my own, I had this idea for, you know, idea for a platform, but I didn't have the resources. I didn't have the the technical know-how to get something like this up off the ground. So I had to start as an agency. And before I could even start as an agency, I had to start as a freelancer. And so as a freelance writer, my, you know, I was tasked with going out there and, and finding new clients. And I did that the way that most writers do, which is, you know, sending their resume and cover letter, applying to job boards and going to the freelance writing sites. Didn't get much traction that way, despite a somewhat impressive writing and marketing resume at the time. So what I did was instead of promoting myself, I went to these companies that were I felt I knew the subject matter. I felt I felt like I could write for them. And I started proactively pitching them content ideas specific to them. So these were ideas that the marketing manager or the person, you know, within inside that company could take a look at and say, yes, I want to see this content on my blog. Let's get started. So that was the, I guess, the, the business, the, the biz dev tool that I used to get my first five, 10 clients. And from there, I quickly had more work than I could handle myself. So I was hiring writers in-house. And that's really how the agency was born from that one simple tactic of really personalizing the pitch to potential to potential clients. So at that point in the process, we were growing at a rate where I couldn't hire writers fast enough. Like I needed to scale this with on demand, with an on demand workforce. So we went out and we looked for platforms. We're not the first platform to do this. So we went out there and looked at other ones out there and we're kind of disappointed in the, you know, the way they operated, some of the features they had, but more importantly, like the quality of, of writers that they were going after. So it was at that stage where I was like, all right, this was sort of the plan all along to build something bigger than an agency. Now's the time to do it. That's really when we decided to rebrand the company and then basically re, you know, launch a spinoff for a completely different company. And that's what, that's what people are seeing and, and interacting with today. Wow. So if you can go back to sort of the mindset you were in when you started as a freelance writer, yeah. how long into it before you sort of started thinking about, okay, I need to grow this to get it into an agency so that I'm not doing the writing. Almost immediately. (laughs) My whole thing, that was the the first big goal that I feel like I achieved as an entrepreneur when I was finally not the one doing the writing or doing the editing or or managing the clients. Like at that point I had separated myself from the, from the tactical work of writing to really focus on sales, on marketing, on operations and things like that. 
But that's, I was thinking about it immediately. I started, once I got my first few clients, I found, I hired somebody to work about 10 hours part-time helping with sales and marketing. And then from there I went, I started looking for writers. Yeah. Wow. So you were writing and selling though, at this point, even when you hired another salesperson. Yes. Yep. Wow. It wasn't until probably about six months in where I, maybe six or seven months in where I completely removed myself from the tactical work. And then you got into the agency model and then would you say like before, was it almost immediately into the agency model that you wanted to grow that until, like you said, till you couldn't hire writers fast enough so that you could get out of agency and move into platform? Correct. A lot of agencies, they're very picky about the clients they work with. They want to work with large companies that have a large budget and they want six month contracts with opt out clauses. And it's very sort of by the books and, and formulaic, I found. We barely said no to anybody. We wanted to take on as much work as we could because in the back of our minds, we knew that the future model is, is not a high touch agency, but the future model is one where, you know, it's, it's an on-demand model. Brands and agencies come to us. We have this awesome community of writers and it's, it's one-off assignments or it's a series of assignments and the brand should be working with the freelancer and they should be the ones negotiating price. It's really not up to us. So when we started the agency, we ran it as if we were gearing up to, to launch something different. And now when you've launched this something different, this platform, is this the end all goal or is there now something that you else you have your sights on? Well, right now the platform is really only designed to, to help companies get written content. It's geared towards marketers, it's geared towards agencies, it's geared towards freelance writers. I think there's a, there's a big opportunity. I'm not gonna give away too much because a lot of this stuff is still up in the air. But I think there's there's a big opportunity to cater to, you know, taking the same concept, like going after the, like the most talented writers or the most talented designers or whatever the whatever the profession may be and building something that's going to connect them to the brands that really value quality over price. I see the workforce. I mean, you can you can read about this anywhere, but like Aberdeen and Gartner and, and Forrester, like all the big an, analyst firms are really predicting that. Over the next 10, 15, 20 years, the, the workforce is going to be even more freelance than it is today. So I see a lot of you know solutions popping up like this. We would love to be one in that conversation for years. Yeah, it's interesting from the outside, just thinking of it so like incrementally how you've done it. And when you take that next big step, you already have sort of the next step in mind. Seems to be your, that's how you've done this. I can't imagine going into work and being like, well, I've done everything I wanted to do. Like, let's just sit back and watch the money roll. And like, I don't ever really see that happening. It's just constantly testing different theories, different ideas. It's constantly prototyping things. I mean, we're releasing features in the platform on a weekly basis. Some of them are really popular, some of them bomb, and we decide to, to change things up based on that. But there is no final vision for what this is. It's, I think it's always a work in progress. Yeah. And let's talk about those, like trying out new features and whether they bomb or succeed. Yeah. At this stage now with a team and a platform that you have, how is it, let's call them projects or whatever you want within the company. Mm -hmm. What's sort of the process that you go through when an idea of a new project or a new feature comes to you? What's the process, whether it's a written or just like an internal gut process, but what do you go through to decide that this is now worth your team's and yours time, energy, and resources. Yeah, so I'm, I, I'm sure there are very scientific processes that they've come up with at like Harvard Business School and all that stuff, but I never went to Harvard Business School. So all I did was like I wrote the, I wrote down like, I think it's, I think we have like six or seven metrics that are just really important for the business. So obviously the number of assignments is a metric or the average churn rates and stuff like that. So we have six or seven metrics up on the whiteboard in the office. And we say, whenever a new idea comes in, we say, how is it going to affect one of these six metrics? And if the answer is a lot, and if the answer is, if that idea is going to affect six out of six, like it's a go, like we're already working on it. But if we're having a hard time making the case for it, even affecting one, we kind of put it on the back burner. So it has to affect that metric and can those metrics change or were those metrics part of the platform kind of when you built it? No, those metrics do change. To give you an example, early on, we had the five, you know, we had five very predictable ones. One that we've recently 
added is on-ramping time. So in other words, how long does it take a customer to sign up to our platform for them to complete that first assignment? So over the past couple of weeks and months, like we've been talking about a lot of features that would, in theory anyway, shorten that time. It would get companies on-ramped faster, give them more valuable information, suggest more writers that they could, you know, they might want to work with. So that was an example of a metric that is there now, but wasn't there when we started. And that was just, it came about as just a result of observation. Okay. So you just keep observing, seeing what's needed, and then also have a roadmap probably overall of what you want to build as well. Yeah. And then kind of iteratively build it, get the feedback, whether it tanks or fails or succeeds, then you continue to keep it or not. Yeah. I mean, it's probably worth pointing out too that a lot of this stuff, like what the platform does today, we were all, we were doing this manually for two years. We felt like we weren't taking that big of a risk in launching the platform because all of this stuff that you can do in the platform, pitching companies unique content ideas, delivering content, billing for content, sharing writing samples, building writing teams. This was stuff we were doing manually offline anyway. And seeing that work just kind of gave us the confidence that, hey, if we launch this platform, people are going to use it and they're probably going to like it. Yeah. So it it's like you've got to build it in-house, test it, know that it works. And you had the customers on the one side, as in you had the companies, right, that were using you as an agency already and coming to you. You knew that they could be the one side. Like your platform is a marketplace, right? Where Correct. Yep. You have companies looking for content and you have providers of that content on the other side. Correct. Was it a struggle then? Because it, it's almost like it was one-sided is what it would seem like to me at first was you had all these companies, but right when you launch, you don't actually have the writers beyond your own writers. You had in-house agency writers to fulfill that side of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we were lucky in that the, the customers, I want, obviously that is the big challenge now is getting the, the customer base to grow. But we started the platform with a good stable of paying clients. So we were able to bring in all of our agency clients to the platform. A lot of people that had worked with us over the years, you know, sort of immediately signed up in that beta phase. But you're right. We then faced this challenge of, all right, you know, if this is going to be a marketplace, well, we have to have service providers. And that's where we spent a good portion of our time leading up to the launch, making sure that freelance writers were aware of this, advertising to them, making sure that we're attending events and recruiting specific writers in some cases so that by the time this was ready, we could sort of populate that as fast as we could. Did you have any experience or look into any people who had experience running marketplaces prior? Yeah. So funny, oddly enough, I have actually worked at two other marketplace companies prior to branching out on my own. So the first one was a company called OnForce, which I worked for for a hot minute back in 2008. But they were a marketplace of like IT shops and IT service providers. So if you needed your printer fixed, you went to their marketplace, somebody came out and fixed your printer. The second company that I worked for, and I was there for about five years, was a company called Utest, which has since rebranded to Applause. They're a community of software testers. So, you know, companies like Apple and Nike and Adidas come to Utest and say, hey, here's the application we've built. Utest sends that to different testers all over the world. So different configurations of operating system and devices and all that stuff. So I was very familiar with the crowdsourcing model, and it's, and it's why that I had this idea for a marketplace, even when I was a solo freelancer. I love it. So you didn't yeah. go to Harvard Business School. I did but, not. But you did. I drove by it a couple of times. <laughs> but you did work at companies that have done what you're doing. Correct. And you got yeah. to work within them to see what works and what doesn't learn, and now you're not reinventing the wheel. Yeah, and I got a front row seat there watching watching other marketplaces succeed. So. At UTest, I was employee number 10, and I think we started, by the time I got there, we had maybe 10 or 15,000 testers uh, on the community side. And by the time I left, it was like over 150,000. Wow. Now, community wasn't my role. My role was to, to write the content and promote the brand while I was there, but I sat right next to the guy that, who was responsible for that. So I got to see what a successful crowdsourcing, what a successful crowdsourcing platform looks like, how it operates. And I was able to take a lot of those learnings over with me to Endash. Nice. I like it. Crowdsourcing platforms. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. So I think I know the answer to this, but you sort of explained how you got like your first customers for Endash now. But how are you guys getting like acquiring customers today? So the way we're, you know, right now it's a lot of, a lot of inbound marketing. 
I distinguish between users and customers. So people, somebody that, you know, signs like a marketing department that signs up to our platform isn't a customer yet. They haven't paid us anything. It's free to sign up to our platform, which is really, I mean, we want to get people to sign up, but from there, it's our job to make them a customer. So I would say the way we're getting users is we're advertising, we're doing a lot of inbound marketing, like I said before, but the way we're getting customers, where we're converting them from users to customers is by making sure we have great writers in our platform. So unlike a lot of other marketplaces where the supply side, or sorry, the, de- yeah, the demand side really generates the, the work. So in other words, in most marketplaces, it's the company saying, hey, I need this designed, I need this written, I need this fixed. And then it's the, you know, the community of service providers that are doing the actual work. In our platform, the service providers, and in this case, the writers, can actually create their own assignments. And they do this by pitching companies unique ideas. So when companies sign on, the primary way that they become a customer is because there's so many writers in the system pitching them awesome content ideas that they want to move forward with, that they want to pay that writer for. So that's the talent of our community is how we're getting customers today. Wow. You advertise and do inbound before that, like, like meaning mm-hmm. content marketing. Yes, correct. Right. So you're doing what you guys are selling, basically. You're doing content marketing to bring people in. They're not users yet, They just or they are users, but they're not customers. Right. And then what you did to get your very first clients back in the agency model, which was pitch ideas, is what you've now taught the people with the writers within the platform to do. That's exactly it. Wow. Yeah. It's like full circle. <laughs> yeah. I love it. It's a fun, it's a fun way to prospect too. Like imagine you're a freelance writer, you know, you're you're looking for new clients. You really want to just copy and paste the same the same cover letter and send the same resume to clients and, you know, maybe hope to stand out? Or do you want to kind of invest yourself in in 10 or 12 or 15 companies a day and pitch them something unique? Like they, nobody's really doing this. And I looked at it, it w- was, the way I looked at it was basically there are freelance journalists pitching the New York Times and the Huffington Post on a daily basis. Like, why aren't there freelance writers pitching companies? This is a huge market for writing. I mean, most freelance writers earn a living writing for businesses, not for publications. So it just seemed to me like a, a logical a logical approach and lo and behold, it worked really well. Can you break down what, what would be included in the pitch? Yeah, so the way, the, what, how I would pitch it, and, and this is how pitches are formatted in the platform. So it was a title, it was a deliverable type, the title of the piece, it had, you know, and then is it a blog, is it an article, is it a white paper? And then like a, a 500 character abstract. So what is this piece about? What's it going to cover? Why your readers would want it? And then source links, additional notes, how soon I could have it delivered. Sometimes I would leave the price off. Now in the platform, the price is included. But that's what I would include in the pitch. So the person on the receiving end is getting something extremely relevant to their brand, extremely useful. It's something they could move forward with, you know, regardless of whether that writer gets it. It's just a much better way to stand out and get on the radar of prospective clients. Right. So it so it's not writing the whole. It's not creating the deliverable. And no, not at all. It. No, it's the no. five hundred character abstract with the why, the what, and then why you're best suited for this. Yep, I like it. Wow, correct. That's impressive. So pitching, yeah, pitching company's title. So if a new or does the, do you need experienced writers within N dash or could somebody listening who is maybe like an experienced writer, but not for the web, but wants to get into it, how do they get to the level where they can work or like come as part of the platform? Yeah. So, I mean, one thing for that's important for, for listeners to know is that for the clients that we have in our system, I had to make sure I say this the right way. Writing is almost a secondary concern. It's the subject matter expertise, which matters more. So in other words, if there, if there's a company that does cybersecurity, it's more important for them to find somebody who knows about cybersecurity versus somebody that has a master's degree in English. Obviously, the, you know, the content needs to read well and it needs to be structured and formatted you know, precisely. But Endash was really designed for writers with specific subject matter expertise. For people that are listening, you, may, you, know, you might be thinking of, all right, what am I an expert in? Whatever that answer is, there's probably a, there's probably a company for you in our platform that would love to hear, love to get content ideas from you. Oh, wow. See, so I'm I'm only thinking this, I mean, being in like the marketing business space, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. it's, it's different in the sense that 
one thing people pay you to write. Yes. <laughs> it's not just for like backlinks and as like a way to kind of get out there and expose yourself to new audiences. Can it be used in that way though? Oh, absolutely. But you get paid yeah. to do it. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, no, no writer in the system is, is doing work for free unless you count. We consider that to be prospecting, right? So like you said before, you're not writing the whole post and then trying to sell it to somebody. You're pitching them an idea in the hopes that they're going to pay you to write it. Like does that, that answer your question or yeah. did I hear that wrong? No, it totally does. It totally yeah. does. Fascinating. Yeah. I, had, yeah. I hadn't been inside of Endash, so I didn't know it. I yeah. mean, I know there's probably people listening and like, well, what do, can I do this? But they think it's all writing experts. Yeah, no, not at all. In fact, it's, it's you know, right now we have a lot of technology companies in there. So if anyone, on, you know, has a good grasp of mobile or a lot of like SaaS based platforms, you can see, I mean, the companies are, it's a fully transparent platform. So you can go into our sign up as a writer and see every company that signed up. Wow. That's awesome. It's really yeah. impressive. So Endash as the platform is about eight months old, I believe. Yeah. I think we published, we had a beta, a closed beta that started at the end of August and really sort of made the official debut at HubSpot's inbound conference. We were a sponsor of that. So that's, that was sort of our big coming out party. Nice. And yeah. so you have six metrics within the company that you're moving towards. What do you have in place? Like, and on what sort of time frame from that eight month start, do you set up like sort of success metrics to know if you're sort of moving in the right direction or if you need to sort of pivot? Yeah. So a lot, you know, it, I go back and forth. There's, there's some in place, but it's, it's always a mix between quality and quantity. So when we, you know, we first launched this, we said, all right, here's the number of writers we want to have at this point. Here's the number of assignments we want completed. Here's the number of customers right on down the line. But over time, we realized, like, do we just want a thousand writers and, and we're cool with that, you know, for this milestone? Or do we want 250 really, really great writers who are in there pitching clients even better ideas? So it's a mix of one thing we're, we're always looking at is our feedback score. So we've embedded a feedback tab into the platform, which kind of helps us monitor both quality and quantity because it's always going back and forth. I don't get I try not to get too hung up on the, the nominal numbers because I feel like if we can get the quality right, you know, make sure writers are happy, customers are happy, the nominal numbers will, will follow from there. Right. And yeah. I guess because you're definitely not like just dipping your toe in and testing the waters. This is the natural evolution of the business and where you're heading. Correct. No matter what those sort of numbers say, and they're going to work some way or another. I think so. Every, every SaaS platform that's out there starts off thinking, hey, we're going to be completely self-service and they're going to have millions of users and it's all going to be great. And you notice that over time, like a lot of those companies, they end up like an enterprise account team or account managers. So, I mean, we're not, we're not too dogmatic in in the vision and what we want it to be we we have an idea and where we think it should go but the market will kind of tell us where it needs to go and it'll be up to us to to adapt excellent excellent all right michael this has been an absolute blast i want to wrap up on one final question for you if i sure. can it's this idea i'm working with calling the entrepreneurial gap so you've been at this now for 4 years or so this entrepreneurship stuff um stepping out of working for other people and now creating your own thing into the platform, successfully hitting those sort of steps that you wanted to take each time. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes as in this creative space, right, we're always, no matter what we accomplish, it seems personally, we always project our successes into the future. Meaning no matter what we accomplish from the outside, we can look really successful to us. There's always in three months when you hit that metric in six months, when you stand on that stage, whatever the goals are that you set, you're going to set five or 10 bigger, loftier ones into the future as soon as you nail those goals. Mm -hmm. And so like walking towards the horizon, the further you walk, the further away it always gets. So I would like it right now, if you could stop, turn around and look behind you and sort of like the highs, the lows, the wins and the losses of this whole process. And tell me how you feel about this journey up until today. I mean, I feel pretty good about it. There was a lot of stuff that I thought I knew about myself, you know, back when I was working full-time jobs, I used to say, oh, I could never be a salesman. I could never learn this technology. I could never do that. As an entrepreneur, you have to do it all. So I'm really, I'm proud of myself that I've made sales before. <laughs> it's not that scary. 
But I think too, in my case, you know, we now have this platform that you can log in, you can interact with, that you can see it evolve. I think, you know, for some businesses, it's hard to have like something tangible to see as a reminder of, you know, just how far you've come. I think for us, you know, that's the platform. I'm in it every day. I'm watching other people use it. So I think, am I on the right track here as far as? Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's just, yeah. It, I, I just don't want you to tell me that you're going to be happy about your success in five years when you do this. I literally want to know what it is up until today, how you feel about it. That's it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just the opportunity. I think that you can look at the horizon as it's always getting further away. I look at it. There's just so much opportunity when you're out there doing this on your own. I mean, I think that that's what's really exciting. I mean, when you're working full time, you know what the title ceiling is, you know what the pay ceiling is. When you're an entrepreneur, you have no idea what it could be. You could be a, a wild success. And if it doesn't work out, you can always try something new or go back in and go back and get a job again. So for me, I think, you know, just having, knowing that how much opportunity is out there is incredibly rewarding and exciting. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it, you know, trade it for anything. That's awesome. So yeah. That's an awesome answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. So in dash the platform, we've got to sort of talk about it in passing now for writers and for content marketing uh, companies that need content marketers. Can you tell them where to go and how to sign up? Sure. Go to www.n-co. That's N-D-A-S-H dot C-O. It's completely free to sign up for both companies and writers. All you need is a LinkedIn account. Otherwise, it should be pretty straightforward, but we have a, a team standing by you know, ready to help you get onboarded, find writers, get things going. So don't be shy in reaching out. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. N-co. I'll link to that in the show notes. Do you have social media that you use? We do. I can I can make sure. Let's see. Uh, I think we're at just at n-co on Twitter. Go. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I can link to that also in the show notes for you out there listening for when you're done working out, jogging, running, working, whatever it is you're doing right now. That will be there on the show notes for Michael Brown's episode. All right, Michael, it's been fun. Yeah, man. John, Thanks. this was fun. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you for joining me. And please just keep doing what you're doing because it's awesome to watch. All right, appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, guys. Today's episode of Hack the Entrepreneur is brought to you by Studio Press Sites, a proven solution that gives you the ease of an all-in-one website builder with the flexible power of WordPress. It's perfect for bloggers, podcasters, and affiliate marketers, as well as those selling physical products, digital downloads, and membership programs. Check out all of the innovative features today at studiopress.com slash hack. And as a Hack the Entrepreneur listener, you'll get your very first month absolutely free. That's studiopress.com slash hack. All right, well, that was a lot of fun. And I, I always enjoy these conversations. And I always also enjoy the part in the show that is right now, the part where I get to go back. I get to go back and I get to listen to the show like you did. So I went back and I listened through to the conversation. And then I went back and I listened through to the conversation again. That second time back through the conversation with Michael, there was something that he had said to me. Something I had missed. I don't know how, but I had. But then I caught it. It was there. It was so very, very, very clear. It was the one thing that Michael said. Did you get it? Did you hear it? Let's do it. Let's find the hack we barely said no to anybody we wanted to take on as much work as we could because in the back of our minds we knew that the future model is is not a high touch agency but the future model is one where you know it's it's an on-demand model and that's the hack michael 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 i love this i love this for a couple different reasons one it's it's kind of contrary to how so many people talk. So many people on my show, I've talked to them and with them about this. The idea of saying no to clients that aren't perfect or being very choosy and talking about your agency, how we only deal with certain people, which is sometimes really good unless you're playing a different game. Unless you're playing like a game of chess where you're thinking three steps ahead, which I absolutely love about your thought process, Michael, going through. Everything that you seem to do, which I brought up in the show, is everything you seem to do is the end goal isn't completing that step of this, like going from freelancing to agency to now platform. 
you were always thinking that ahead. So you're taking on as many clients as possible because the end goal is not building up a high touch agency. The end goal is building up the high touch agency until you cannot contain it anymore and then rolling that into a platform. So I love this. I love this because it's contrary thinking about the agency, but it's contrary thinking not in the immediate sense. It's really thinking long term. It's this idea of playing chess with your business, thinking three steps ahead. Everything you're doing now, think about why you're doing it. And if you were thinking about it only in the one step, it oftentimes doesn't make sense, right? If you're starting a high touch agency for content creation, you probably want to pick only certain customers. But if you're like Michael and you're thinking three steps ahead about this platform you want to build, then the idea is to get as many clients as possible as fast as possible. I really like this idea of thinking ahead, not just thinking in this immediate term or what you're trying to do. I think it allows you to differentiate from your competition and also to sort of really emphasize the speed and what he was trying to accomplish later than right now. And really just, I don't know, I really dig the way Michael does this. And I like that it's contrary and I like that he succeeded to roll this into like different from freelance to high touch agency straight into a platform, not straight, it was years, it took years, but he was always thinking that from the very beginning. There's definitely, definitely something to be learned from that. Michael, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that was a lot of fun. Hackthentrepreneur.com. Head over there, get onto the email list and check out Michael's show notes. They're over there. A link to everything we talked about, a link to n-.co, as well as n on Twitter. And check out the blog. Head over there. Check it out. We've been been writing a lot once once a week and then every second Wednesday we have the new How I Started interviews. It's text-based interviews, 21 questions from a cool different entrepreneur, how they got started, how they got their first customers, how they got their customers today, tools they use, that sort of thing. And it's been getting some great feedback. So check it out over over on the old site, you know? Yeah. (laughs) All right. It's been fun. Thank you so much for stopping by. Thanks for taking the time. I really, truly do appreciate it. And please, until next time. Keep hacking the entrepreneur.